you would please get a Bible and turn to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Timothy chapter 4. Do you remember the last thing that Jesus said in the Bible? Anybody want to take a shot? I remember the very last thing Jesus said in the Bible. Wrong. Quote, here it is. Yes, I'm coming quickly. That's the last thing he said. You can check it if you want. Some of you go to the map to take a left, right? You'll run into it. Yes, I'm coming quickly. Do you believe that, church? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is coming soon? I don't know. It's been 2,000 years. Are you sure? How can he say I'm coming quickly and it's been 2,000 years? Because the day of the Lord is as, right? 1,000 years, 1,000 years like a day. Do you remember the second to the last thing Jesus Christ said in the Bible? Not the, the last, the second to the last thing. He said, quote, I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. I'm the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. Who is David? Who is David famous for? He's the king of what? Israel, right? How did he become king? He killed Goliath. Who is Goliath? He's a giant. What's a giant? Evil incarnate. That's what a giant is. And what's the most famous giant's name? We've already said it, right? Goliath. Some preachers and Sunday school teachers, that's all you'll get. You'll just stop right there. (laughs) But the Bible has much to say about giants. In fact, I pretty much looked up every verse in the Bible as it relates, and I almost, it's almost a hundred verses about evil incarnate. You know what? Almost a hundred verses in the Bible about giants. Now, why do I bring that up? Well, Jesus said, I am the root and descendant of David. David ascended to his kingship by eliminating evil incarnate. And so when he says, I am the root and descendant of David, that means he is the promised Messiah who is to come to fully eliminate sin, to eliminate death, uh, demons, the devil, and the kingdom of darkness. And that's why Jesus Christ has come. He's purchased our salvation, and he's given us as a church marching orders. Go make disciples of uh, of all the nations. So I was out of the pulpit this last Sunday, and that means I'm about to burst on the inside, okay? Spiritual impression without spiritual expression leads to spiritual depression. Can I get an amen? And I don't want to be depressed this morning, right? Spiritual impression without spiritual expression leads to spiritual depression. So I'm just going to go ahead and get to it if that's all right. May I have your attention? I don't want to assume I have it. May I have your attention? I have a word from the Lord, from the word of God. You can check me the entire message. Amen. I've got a message from the Lord. If you come hungry, you're going to be fed. You're going to be fed. Let's look at these lessons on uh, church life in these last days from 1 Timothy chapter 4. My purpose today is not just mere information, but transformation of us individually, but also transformation of this nation. And ultimately, not just America, the whole world. Is it okay if I have uh, in my purpose today for us to be more like Jesus? Amen. Is it okay if I have in my heart uh, as a result of this message, America would be better? Amen. Is it okay if I have my sights on the entire cosmos as a result of this message? Amen. Amen. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is not a TED talk, right? I'm not going to give you a devotional. This is a message from the Lord. Now, a bit of a warning. In this message, God's word will be applied to the world in which we live. Amen? Okay? Are we good with that? If you're not used to hearing that kind of preaching, then get ready. It's coming. All right? Since God has called local pastors to apply God's word to their world, that means I get to choose where in our world and how in our world this message is applied. Again, since I was out last Sunday, let me just uh, review where we've been in the last uh, two weeks, all right? 
So if you, uh, this is your first time hearing this message, you haven't been with us in 1 Timothy, these last couple weeks we've seen that in these latter days, God reveals that some nominal Christians, meaning in name only, will revolt from the faith. And we're seeing this before our eyes, right? Worship leaders, pastors, they're revolting from the, uh, the faith. We also have seen that God reveals that some nominal Christians will revolt from the faith by listening to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Demons ultimately just don't enter people and cause their head to spin around 360 and vomit green something out of people's mouths. Ultimately, sorry, that was kind of gross. Uh, ultimately, demons teach, okay? They teach. That's why pastors slash elders they better be men of God's word. They better be discerning. They better know how to teach because ultimately there's a clash between the teaching of the elders against the teaching of demons. Welcome to the church. It's on like Donkey Kong, as the students might say. Spiritual warfare. And then we also have seen that God reveals some nominal Christians will revolt from the faith, but good servants of Christ will point these things out. That's in uh, verses, um, verse 6 of a chapter or two ago. Now, Brother Ed Etheridge, I want to say thank you so much for Brother Ed coming and, and preaching in my stead last week. He preached from verses 7 through 10, and his message was on spiritual discipline and godliness in ministry. So I want to thank him for uh, being willing. This is not normal in the church world, if you guys know this or not. It's not normal for a guest pastor to come in and just simply pick up where the church has been, right, as it, as, as it relates to going through a book of the Bible. And so I, I praise God for Brother uh, Ed's heart. He says, no problem, let's do it. And so, and the reason why I do that is because I'm trying to model for us that this church is all about the Word of God. Amen? Not necessarily me in the pulpit, although when I'm in the pulpit, amen, right? God uses people, right? But it's about the Word of God. So I'm, I'm out uh, for a Sunday. Another man comes, he's in the Word of God. He's in the Word of God, trying to model that for us. And that brings us to our passage for today. So hear the Word of the Lord, 1 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 11. And God's man says, Prescribe and teach these things. Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Till I come, give attention to the public uh, reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things. I wonder if you've ever read this in the Bible before. For as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Blessed be uh, the Lord. Father, as we stand in your presence, Lord, as we move into your word, come, come. Lord, you know our need. You know the need of this city and this nation and the world. Come. Press us more into the image of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. So let's look at these lessons on church life, particularly related to pastors. Number one, God wants pastors to give certain orders. God wants pastors to give certain orders. Verse 11, prescribe and teach these things. The word translated prescribe literally means to give orders or to command. Most English Bibles have the word command. Unfortunately, in this case, the NASB doesn't. I'm totally disheartened by that because that's the Bible version that I use. It says prescribe and teach these things, but why didn't you just say what it said? Command and teach these things, right? Well, in the context, what are the pastors to command? What are the pastors to be giving orders uh, in regard to? Well, exactly what we've been looking at for the last uh, couple weeks. The pastors are to warn God's people that some who claim to be Christians, they're going to leave the faith. They're going to revolt from the faith. They're not going to listen to their pastors. 
They're going to listen to lies. They're going to listen to deceitful spirits, to doctrines of demons. And so, uh, piggyback off of uh, the passage that Brother Ed preached from, we're to discipline ourselves in godliness. Now, I do want to highlight that word, command and teach these things. There are three other places in 1 Timothy where that word command is used in the original. And as, you, as I uh, read them to you, have in the back of your mind pastors, okay? Try to put your, uh, your shoes, uh, your feet in pastor's shoes, but also think of these verses from your own life. For example, 1 Timothy 1.3, Paul told Timothy to order men not to teach strange doctrine. 1 Timothy 1.3, as I urged you upon my departure for Macedonia, remain on at Ephesus so that you may, and it's translated, instruct certain men not to teach strange doctrines. But the, the word in the original is command, so that you would command certain men not to street, uh, teach strong, uh, strange doctrines. Number two, 1 Timothy 1.18 Paul ordered Timothy to remain strong in his faith. He said, this command I entrust to you, or this order I entrusted to you, Timothy, my son, in accordance with the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you fight the good fight, keeping faith in a good conscience, which some have rejected and suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. And then the third one, Paul tells Timothy to command those who are rich. 1 Timothy 6.17 in the NASB, it says, instruct those who are rich in this present world not to be conceited or to fix their hope on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly supplies us with all things to enjoy. Again, they, they kind of watered it down. It's not instruct those who are rich. It's command. Okay? It's order. By the way, how many of you are rich? Raise your hand. I just see a couple. Okay, we're living in America. Get your hands up. Amen. Only in our nation can you basically go to a street corner and beg all day and make about 40000 a year. Right? We are. Now, I know it's all relative. I know. It's not, it's not the same. But uh, if we're in America, beloved, oh, we are rich. We are rich. I wish I could take you to East Africa. Amen. You'll come back happier. Let me tell you, beloved. Amen. You get back in your bed. You get back and you, in that, that shower, you can turn it to the left, warm, hot, turn it to the cold. Many people of the world do not have that. How's your refrigerator looking? How's your closet looking? Uh, you're, you, got some, you got some food in your closet, your pantry, amen? We are rich. We are rich. We live in America. Well, in application here, living up to these charges or living up to these orders or these commands bring real benefit in this life as well as in eternity. So we need to have a pure heart of love. We need to have a good conscience that's not, uh, that's not messed up with guilty feelings, right, because of sin. Have a clean conscience. We're to avoid false doctrine. and We're to have a strong faith, not weakened by hypocrisy. Now, we... Now, we could, or you could, listen to that and say, well, that's for the pastors. No, no, it is for the pastors, amen. But what's good for Timothy should be good for all of us, amen, right? And by the way, if you regularly pray for your, your pastors, make, make these points of this message part of your, your prayer points. All right, number two, God wants pastors to be an example to believers. <clears throat> to believers, beginning in verse 12 here. Look no, uh, let no one look down on your youthfulness. Now, why do you think he would say that? What's the implication? Don't let anybody look down on your youthfulness. The implication is what? There's some people, what? Looking down on his youthfulness, right? Most scholars generally agree that Timothy is most likely in his 30s. In the ancient world of the New Testament, you could be uh, considered youthful even into your 40s. So, again, the indication, what's going on? Verse 12 indicates, by the way, that just blew up a whole lot of youth group understanding of church. Did <laughs> you know, people in their 30s and their 40s still in the youth group. Okay. Uh, verse 12 indicates that Timothy's age 
might be seen as a handicap or a detriment where some of the believers, listen, not only some of the believers, but perhaps even some of the elders who are older than him, right? So there might be a kind of looking down, there's a handicap on you, Timothy, because you're younger, not just from the believers, but also perhaps from some of the elders who are older than him. This is why Paul tells Timothy to show himself as an example, right? He's trying to fix it here. Older men can want control over younger men in the church. And I experienced that in my ministry for sure. My first church where I pastored while in seminary, I got into trouble with two leading deacons because I did not get their permission to do something. Guess what it was? I called for a church-wide three-day fast. Anything wrong with that? I didn't think so. I was able to get the seminary president to come and speak. We got the director of associations, the local uh, Baptist association, to come and speak. Uh, we also got a professor from the seminary to come and an outstanding buddy of mine. We've had him here uh, come, fellow student Jedediah Blake. Well, after the business meeting where I announced this good news, they came up to me and they rebuked me. They rebuked me. They wanted me to get permission from the church in order for us to do this. Some of you are looking at me like I was looking at them. What? Uh, so were they excited about the fast? No. Were they excited that our little church was able to have a, some, some outstanding leaders come in our church? No, they were not. They also rebuked me for not getting permission to use the copier from the church secretary. <laughs> I looked at them and I said, the way things are going, I'm going to have to ask you permission to use the bathroom. I actually said that to them. That didn't make them happy. By the way, uh, well, never mind. This was the church where the chairman of the trustees was a small-time dope dealer who tithed his drug money in cash and you could smell the marijuana on the cash after the collection as they took it and walked down the aisle and put it on the, yeah. Oh, what a great introduction to pastoral ministry that was to me. Yeah. There, there's some other stories from that, but it is what it is. Praise the Lord. I remember, I remember praying to the Lord, Lord, I just want to preach. And it's as if the Lord's saying, yeah, but I'm going to teach you what it means to pastor a people. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In my 30s, I can remember an older veteran pastor. He teased me in front of the church. He told the church that he had ties older than I was. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. Brother Holy, I got ties older than him. <clears throat> Several people laughed. I laughed. It was not spiteful. It was just teasing. It was fine, right? Then I got up to preach, and I really wanted to tease him back. I wanted to say that it was true that he did have ties older than me. The only problem with that is he continues to wear them. Amen. But I refrained. I refrained. I refrained. So what's going on here? It's very likely that Timothy's being looked down, not by the whole church, certain sections uh, of older members, maybe even elders, because he's younger than they are. Well, what's the corrective? What's the corrective? Look at the five areas where God specifically highlights where pastors should be an example of those who believe. And these five could be its own message, literally. Verse, uh, where are we? Are we in verse 12? Yeah, verse 12 could be its own message. Let's just tee these up real quick. He's to be a, uh, an example in speech. By the way, who should Timothy's ultimate example be in speech? Say his name. Jesus. Think, think of that with all, all five of these. Conduct, who should Timothy's ultimate guide or example of conduct be? Jesus. Love, well, what's the definition of that? Where, does, where, where should Timothy go for uh, how to be loving? What's the ultimate example of that? Jesus. Amen. Faith, faith, Jesus. Purity, Jesus. May God make us more like Jesus in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. Number three, God wants pastors to read, exhort, 
and teach the Scripture. This is interesting. Verse 13, until I come, Paul says, give attention to the public reading of Scripture. Number one. By the way, this could be another message all by itself. Number two, what? To exhortation. That's what you're hearing now. Exhortation and to teaching. That's what you're hearing now. Why does God want pastors to read, exhort, and teach his word? Why? Because we're living in the last days. Evil exists. Supernatural evil exists. Doctrines of demons are being taught. And the spirit of the age pulls people away from God's word. There are churches that are meeting all across the fruited land, if I could put it that way, where the pastors do not open their Bible in the pulpit. They will quote a poem. They will talk about the latest marketing or leadership principles. They will speak in psychological terms, slap a Bible verse on it, and throw in some personal illustration where they come out the, win the winner. And if you're a normal Christian in America, you most likely did not engage in God's Word last week, or if you did, it was very minimal. So remember, beloved, not as a browbeating, no, for the sake of your soul. To neglect God's word is to neglect God. Men shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Feed your soul, beloved. Feed your soul. If you're weak in the word, you're weak in the faith. And you're more open to demons and lies and manipulation. Manipulation. Every two years, Ligonier Ministries and Lifeway Research, they partner together to take the theological temperature of the United States. They want to help Christians better understand today's culture and to equip the church with better insights for discipleship. Let me give you just a couple of their findings. Again, this is after two, year, two years. These were asked of both U.S. adults and U.S. adult evangelical believers. Okay, So ask of U.S. citizens who are adults, also ask of evangelical believers. Here's the statement. God learns and adapts to different circumstances. What would you say, Christian? Yes or no? God learns and adapts to different circumstances. The U.S. adult finding, 51 said, yeah. 31% said, no. The Christians said, 48%, yeah. 43%, no. Ah, they believe God changes. You're not getting that teaching from this pulpit, amen. Listen, you've heard me say this. God doesn't Google, amen. God doesn't have a library to consult, amen. He learns nothing. He is all-knowing. He is omniscient. This idea that God learns and adapts smells like process theology, even if you don't know what process theology is. I mean, what, what's the key word in process theology? Process. That God is somehow in process. Dr. Gregory Boyd is the point man for process theology in America to the degree with which God the Father wasn't quite sure that the Son of God would actually be crucified because he really doesn't know the future. He hasn't ordained the future. He's got his hands off the free will of man. Therefore, he's not really sure what's going to happen as it relates to the crucifixion of the Son of God. Hmm. Man, that gets me going. That's bad. That's not the God of the Bible. How about this? See this one up. Everyone is born innocent in the eyes of God. U.S. adult finding, 71%. Yeah. U.S. adult in America, 21%. No. U.S. evangelical Christians, 65%. Yeah. Somebody please read Romans 1, 2, 3. Let's go back to the Old Testament. All right, Ten Commandments. Anybody have any children out there? Can I get an amen? Look at this precious little baby. So cute and cuddly and innocent, we must teach him how to be selfish. No, it comes 
naturally. It comes naturally. God's word makes clear that all humans are, quote, by nature, children of wrath, Ephesians 2, 3. Psalm 51, 5, behold, David said, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceives me. Romans 5, 19, for as through the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, even so through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. Right? Through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Who's that one's name? His name's Adam. But praise God for the second Adam. His name is Jesus, right? He makes us righteous. This truth is foundational for an accurate understanding of the gospel and of our absolute need of God's grace in salvation. In salvation. Are you ready for some application? Here we go. Based on this neglect of God's word and this uh, lack of Bible intake in America, not knowing these basic truths about God's word, we have people that will go to church. We will have people that will be nice. They will make friends. They will uh, have lunch together and, and have devotional Bible studies together. They might even help people, but they will not apply the gospel of Jesus Christ to the government of this nation. Where millions and millions of people are harmfully impacted by ungodly antichrist policies. Some, some, uh, so, some so-called Christians vote for the ungodly policies of the Democrat Party. But those Christians, stay with me now, but those Christians who go to church, who say they love Jesus, who are nice people, all of a sudden are actually not nice when you point this out to them. Have you noticed that? All of a sudden, the nice people aren't so nice. What happened to the nice? What happened to the nice? It goes out the window, and then they start saying not nice things about you. Beloved, do you not see the bloodshed in the streets of America? I see violence. I see bloodshed. Look what the Democrat defund the police has wrought in the cities of America. Fentanyl overdoses, now the number one cause of death. You guys care about people? Number one, fentanyl, number one cause of death among U.S. adults ages 18 to 45. They cook it up in China. They send it through Mexico, through our open uh, southern border. I'm here to say Jesus Christ did not die on the cross for his people to support the slaughter of innocents. He did not die for our sin so that we could support more sin in the nation by how we vote. Jesus Christ is calling his bride, his bride, the church, not Babylon, the mother of all harlotry. Amen. Amen. It's great to be back, beloved. How's your week going? Okay. You good? Now, that's on the public sphere, right? That's on the public sphere. This same gospel, it changes our hearts, right? It changes our hearts. We have a new want to. And now we are no longer slaves to sin. Now we're slaves to righteousness. You're going to be a slave of, of one or the other, right? You've heard me say this. There's the kingdom of darkness. There's the kingdom of light. There's no kingdom of shade. We're either going to be slaves of sin or slaves of righteousness. When you're born again, you cannot help but live righteously. And when you're born again, you cannot help be miserable when you sin. Amen. Amen. That's how you know you're, you're a believer. When you sin, it bothers you. You don't have a clean conscience. The Spirit of God will not let you be okay with sin. Well, let's go to number four. Some of y'all don't look too happy. Let's go to number four. I'm just, I'm just teasing you. God wants pastors to develop their gift. God wants pastors to develop their gift. Verse 14, do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through the uh, prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery, meaning the elders, presbyteros. So, there's a debate within the church family 
that says, uh, some people teach that if you're a Christian, you have one spiritual gift. I shouldn't do this. I should do this. You have one spiritual gift. You have, that's all. That's all you get. No more spiritual gifts for you. You have one. That's it. They're uh, like the suit Nazi. No more for you, right? You just get one. Uh, there's other, t- other pastors will teach that the, spiritual, uh, the, the Holy Spirit gives several gifts to believers. I'm just kind of curious, which, which one would you go to? How many of you think you just get one spiritual gift? Raise your hand. Oh, we have a lot of gracious people. Are. How, many get, how many think you have more than one spiritual gift? Okay, all right. Uh, I, well, how many of you believe that also the Spirit can empower or equip a believer based on like the circumstance as well, right? Not like, oh, can't use him. He doesn't have that spiritual gift. Next. That's, that's not right either, right? But here in verse 14, it is in the singular, okay? Uh, do not neglect, uh, neglect the spiritual gift. Uh, so pastors are, are gifted uh, in different ways. I would say that, I would say all elders have the gift of teaching. I would, I would argue that. I'd go to bat to that. Uh, all elders have the, the gift of uh, teaching and preaching. Now, based on the personality, that'll come out in different ways, right? Totally different ways. Uh, so pray, pray for me that I do not neglect this gift of preaching and teaching because there are a lot of ways that I can do so, and they're all good. They're all good. So this is where we're getting into the nitty-gritty of ministry. Pray, pray for our pastors that they would not neglect their gift, their spiritual gift. And again, this is, this is something that was given to me. It's not innate in me, uh, preaching and teaching. All glory goes to God, amen? With that gift, okay, it's very quick for me to sniff out this um, uh, inaccurate teaching, not that I'm 100% or I'm like Jesus. I'm just saying because of that gift, uh, I can sniff out very quickly when there's bad teaching going on. We're, we're living in a day where, sad to say, you actually really don't need the gift anymore. It's like, is this not obvious? You know what I'm saying? It's so blatant. You can have the spiritual sensitivities of a red brick and find out, hey, this is not right, right? For example, the lead teaching pastor, one of America's largest churches, suggests the problem with the modern church okay, is, in his words, quote, our incessant habit of reaching back into the old covenant concepts, teachings, sayings, and narratives. And what is he talking about? The Old Testament. Therefore, he addresses fellow church leaders. Okay, So it's one thing to have a position He's trying to influence other local pastors. So now it's game on. It's public square, right? To consider unhitching their teaching of following Jesus to the Old Covenant because, in his words, when it comes to stumbling blocks to faith, the Old Testament is right up there at the top of the list. He's saying that about God's Word. It's amazing. Well... Same guy, same guy tweeted this. The Christian faith doesn't rise and fall on the accuracy of 66 ancient documents. It rises and falls on the identity of a single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. Are you all following? You see how bad that is? The Christian faith does not rise and fall on the accuracy of the Bible. What? This, it rises, in, in his words, it rises and falls on the identity of a single individual, Jesus of Nazareth. How do we know about Jesus of Nazareth apart from this great book? Are y'all following? Listen to me. If you're not following, you might be listening to demons, deceiving spirits. How do we know apart from the revelation of God about Jesus of Nazareth? This better be accurate. 
Amen. Yeah, you see, he's trying to be cute. He, he's, a, he's, either, he's either a modern liberal and he doesn't know it, or he's just really bad, really black, bad uh, ignorance. And again, you know what he's trying to do? His motive is good. He's trying to reach people. And so all that Old Testament weirdo stuff, they're not going to do that. Let's just stick with Jesus, right? The resurrection. Oh, my word, how bad that is. Hello? What? I'll go back to how I began. What's the second to the last thing Jesus Christ said? I am the root and descendant of David. <laughs> all that's Old Testament, right? Oh, yeah. Jesus is Jewish. He's the Jewish Messiah, and he has Gentiles inside as well. Oh, it's so vexing to me. So vexing. So there's a crisis in church today. People want to be consumers of the church, not servants. People want a therapeutic gospel. The belly, I call it the belly button gospel, right? Just for them, just for their family. Don't tell me about how bad the world is. Just give me something for me. Give me something for my, my family. People also have a progressive agenda who come to church. They give people permission to not vote or to vote for ungodly uh, policies. And then we have Jesus Christ saying, I'm the root and descendant of David. He's the son of the living God. Everything changes with Jesus when he gets up out of the grave three days later. And this same Jesus will soon return to finish what he started. Amen. And ultimately, listen, I'm bringing you a warning, both encouraging and warning. When he comes back, he's going to burn it down. He's going to burn the universe down. He's coming in judgment. His eyes are a fire. Sorry, charismatic worship leaders. That's not about love for the bride. When it says eyes of fire, it's eyes of judgment. Judgment. Not a lot of that kind of preaching going on today. It's a strong message. It's a real message. And ultimately, listen, it's a loving message because the same Jesus who is going to be the judge this same Jesus came and died on the cross for sinners. We who are unworthy, he makes us worthy by what he accomplished for us on the cross. Amen. And then he's got the audacity to go into all the world, go into all the nations and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them most of what I told you, amen, no, teaching whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even into the end of the age. Oh, praise God for the presence of Jesus Christ. Amen. Where would we be in our mission without the low? Where would we be as we bounce in 2020? Are we in 20? We're in 22. I almost said 2020. It's been a long two years, hasn't it? Where would we be with all this stuff as Christians in 2022 without the low? Jesus says, I'm with you always, even until the end of the age. That age that the end of that age is coming. We're seeing it before our very eyes. He's coming in power and glory to destroy his enemies. What are you trying to do, Pastor Mark? You're trying to scare people? Well, if it gets them in the kingdom, amen. Be afraid. Be afraid of God, this God who's coming in Jesus Christ and receive his mercy, his grace, and his love. He is the root and descendant of David. David came to eradicate incarnate evil. And ultimately, the promised one who is to come, the seed of Eve, who is promised to come and crush, to literally displace, it's a very violent verb, to crush, to displace the head of the serpent. He was supposed, the Messiah is supposed to fix sin and death. The Messiah is supposed to come and fix the proliferation of sin through his teaching. The Messiah is supposed to come and fix the problem of the nations who are now divided by tongue and by uh, principalities and powers. And Jesus does just that. He does just that. When he comes, he's going to restore all things to Eden's paradise. Are you ready for that, beloved? Are you ready for the full restoration of all things 
Amen. Number five, God wants pastors to progress in ministry. He wants us to progress in ministry. Verse 15, take pains with these things. Be in them. The NASB supplies the absorbs. It's not in the original. Be in them, but it helps us understand, right? Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. The ESV says, practice these things. Or the NEB says, make these matters your business. <laughs> I like that. NIV says, be diligent in these things. You have the uh, King James Version, meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them. All right, so let's pause and bring the lens back a little bit. Right, let's see the flow. The church needs pastors that are focused on Scripture, right? Verse 13, they must read it, exhort it, teach it. The church needs pastors to focus on their gift. The body of Christ needs pastors that are absorbed with these things, take pains with these things. Why? Why? So that the church would have pastors that grow, pastors that progress or progress, right? That have progress. And why is that? Pastors should be more advanced than the people. It's not a cocky pride thing. I'm just saying, pastors should be more advanced than the people. Amen. They should be further down the road because the pastors should be growing and progressing in the things of God. Then what's going to happen? Then the church will grow and progress in the things of God. Right? If a pastor is stale and he's at that level, then most likely that's where the church is going to be at. If the pastor is growing, right, growing in faith, growing in knowledge, growing what he's called to be and do, have a progressing church. I, don't, I mean that in a good way, a progressing church. <laughs> Not the progressive way. I know you're with me. <laughs> so if you hear something new from the pulpit, your first response, if you've never heard it before, your first response would be, well, I don't believe that. Your first re response should be, oh, where's that in the Bible? Right? Like a, the, the Berean believers, they searched the scriptures to see whether these things were so. Again, back to the word, back to the word. Number six, God wants pastors to persevere in ministry. Oh, this is verse 16. I didn't hear this one growing up in church. I heard of John 3.16, but I didn't hear about this one. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.16. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do, are you ready? This will ensure salvation both for yourself and for those who hear you. What? What is going on here in verse 16? For Timothy, for pastors, is this salvation by ministry? <laughs> hey, Timothy, you want to be saved? Then watch your life closely. Salvation by ministry? We would say what, church? No, right? For, for the people, is this salvation by pastor? Is this salvation by pastor? Are you saved by a pastor? You better roar back at me a big no, amen, right? What's going on here? The word of God and the vessels that God uses through pastors, those are the means by which God carries out uh, his kingdom biz uh, business. He can do it apart from it, but he usually does it through his uh, servants. And so, as it relates to what's going on here in, at Ephesus, Paul is telling Timothy, hey, be mindful of this. This is serious stuff. This is serious stuff. Persevere in these things. Persevere. Oh, listen, in, in, in church life, we're, we are really quick to be a lot like Roman Catholics. Real quick to say, psh, 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 you're saved. 
We take the doctrine of the security of the believer real quick and say, if you're uh, once saved, what? Oh, once saved, what? Always saved. Real quick. He's saved. Did you pray the prayer? Good. He's saved. Did you pray the prayer? You walk down the aisle. Okay. You're saved. So, uh, verse 16 is more about the doctrine of sanct sanctification, right? Which teaches that God, by his Holy Spirit, uh, grows his children, grows his children. So, that should mark us as God's people, whether pastor or church member. We should be growing in the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit produces in us. Amen? Right? Produces the desire, the want to, the ability to do it. And so it is so dangerous when we name the name of Jesus and we're stuck in the mud. And it's, all, it's usually a slow f uh, fade. It's a slow fade. Slow fade. Usually the devil doesn't come out and reveal himself in all of his unglory. It would be quite obvious, right? He transforms himself as an angel of light. He speaks the best kind of lie that has a measure of truth in it. And so this, this, this truth that God uh, grows us in sanctification, I think that's what's behind verse 16. So you want to be a pastor? Well, you better pay close attention to yourself big time. This should put the fear of God in all of us. You want to be a pastor? You better watch your teaching here. Persevere in these things, not just for you, but for the precious people that listen to you speak. Wow. Early in this uh, past century, a London newspaper carried an advertisement that read this, quote, men wanted for hazardous darkness and constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. The ad was signed by the famous Arctic explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton, and it brought inquiries from thousands of men. I'll repeat that. Men wanted for hazarded, hazardous darkness and constant danger, safe return, doubtful, honor and recognition in case of success. Wow. I agree with Warren Wearsby, who said if Jesus Christ had advertised for workers, the announcement might have read something like this, quote, men and women wanted for difficult task of helping to build my church. You will often be misunderstood, even by those working with you. You will face constant attack from an invisible enemy. You may not see the results of your labor, and your reward will not come till... After all your work is completed, it may cost you your home, your ambitions, even your life. Wow. Who's going to sign up for that to follow King Jesus? Amen? We have. Amen? And yet he, he calls to each one of us, right? If you come after me, you must deny yourself daily, take up your cross, and what? Follow me. It goes back to you can't be passive in following Jesus Christ. You must, the verb, the command, you must follow me. He's on the move. Amen. The, the king is on the move. He's breaking down the bars of iron and setting people free from the shackles of darkness. He's on the move, beloved. And the gates of hell cannot stop King Jesus. He's going to build his church. Amen. Amen. No servant is greater than his master. Jesus has never asked of you and me what he himself has not done, right? None of us are worthy of him, and yet he has made us worthy of him. None of us are worthy to be his servants, and yet he's called us to be servants of his kingdom. Amen, child of God. Listen, Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother or sister. Amen. He's not ashamed to call you a sister. He's not ashamed to call you uh, brother or mother. In fact, it reminds me, remember, perhaps one of the most difficult things Jesus said, where uh, I actually made a joke of it with one of my sons as we batted back and forth about Scripture. You remember that? I use that out of context where the father says to Jesus, uh, have mercy for my son is a lunatic. Remember, I, I, I texted that to my four sons. It was their devotional for the, for the day, uh, just being uh, silly. 
And then uh, Jason, who's here, he, he texted back uh, the passage that said, uh, I hate you, Father. And then he quoted where Jesus says, if anyone you know, doesn't hate his father or his mother or his own child, he's not worthy of me. I mean, think about that. So your child or Jesus, which are you going to choose? Your mother or Jesus, which one are you going to go with? Your mother-in-law or Jesus? That might be a little easier. I'm not sure. It depends, but, you know. Your grandfather or Jesus? Who are you going for? Many people are choosing child over Jesus. Because child's doing this. Child says this. Child's living like this. Many people choosing grandmother over Jesus. No servant is greater than his master. Remember that time? I think this is coming from the Gospel of John where the people are filling the house and the people love Jesus. Sinners love Jesus up to a point. Hey, Jesus, your mother and your brothers want to talk to you. They're at the door. Remember what Jesus' response was? Did he get up and say, oh, oh, mom's here? Well, I better make sure mom's happy. Yeah, mama, what you want? Wouldn't that be nice of Jesus, right, to love and respect his mom? When mama calls, you better come. Hmm. Your mom's outside with your brothers. What did he say? Who's my mother and my brother? These, those who do the word of God. Amen. Amen. Oh, there's an idol out there. There's a spirit cooking up some idolatry, and it's family. It's family. The way is narrow, beloved. The way is narrow, and it's hard, and it's difficult, and yet it's also easy, all at the same time. All at the same time. And we need God's wisdom uh, and discernment for these situations. We must persevere in ministry. Do not give up, beloved. Do not give in. Do not compromise. Let's continue to fight sin together. Amen. Let's fight ourselves if we have to. I think that's what Jesus meant by deny yourself daily, right? Let's fight ourselves if we have to. There will always be a you that's doing the denying, and there will always be a you that is denied. That's what he meant. That's what he said. And that also reflects how sin has so displaced us. But don't give in. Fight sin. Fight yourself if you have to. Jesus Christ is worthy of persevering. Amen? He's worthy of the gruel. He's worthy of the, the difficulty. He's worthy of standing in the midst of it. Jesus Christ is the root and descendant of David. Do not give up the fight. Do not give in to sin. Love him more than you do now. Amen. Let's try to fight sin with the help of our God better than we did last week. Amen. Let's worship him more than we do now. Why? Because in these days, God wants pastors to give certain orders. He wants us to be an example to believers. Read, exhort, um, teach scripture, develop your gift, progress in ministry, and persevere in ministry.